stream is starting just now. So then I think we can. I, I see Luca is on the list now. Ah, okay, great. Oh, he's here, yeah. Super. Then, so I think we can start then the award session. So I'm happy to, to see you all here at this uh, award session consisting of uh, three parts. So I will uh, show just one moment. OK. So uh, I will present the awardees together with Anush Dawar and Dave Miller. And we will start with the Girl Prize Award, which is uh, jointly with ACM SIGACT in honor of Kurt Gödel, uh, yeah, in recognition of his major contributions to, to the theory of computation and to many, many other problems. Then um, Dave Miller will continue with the Lix Award, so with the Clean Award and with the Lix Test of Time uh, Award. And finally, we will. Uh, uh, go over to, to the EATCS Press Google Award. And this will be thus the session. So I will now stop and um, pass the um, pass the stage to um, Anush Dawak for the Goodle Prize. Uh, thank you very Please. much, Anka. Thank you very much, Anka. So um, it's my great honor and privilege to announce the uh, 2020 Gödel Prize. As uh, Anka said, this is a prize jointly awarded by the EATCS and ACM SIG Act. And the prize is for outstanding papers in theoretical computer science. Um, as I'm sure um, many of you already know, the um, Gödel Prize 2020 is awarded to Robin Moser and Gabor Tardosh, and I'm very happy to see both of them join us here today. For their paper, a constructive proof of the general Lovas local lemma, which appeared in the Journal of the ACM in 2010. This is a paper which has been enormously influential, not just in terms of the result proved, but in terms of the methods introduced in the proof. Um, and over the past decade, they have found very widespread use in theoretical computer science. So allow me to read from the citation for the award. The Lovas local lemma is a fundamental tool of the probabilistic method. It enables one to show the existence of certain objects, even though they occur with exponentially small probability. The original proof was not algorithmic and subsequent algorithmic versions had significant losses in parameters. This paper provides a simple, powerful algorithmic paradigm that converts almost all known applications of the Lovas local lemma into randomized algorithms matching the bounds of the existence proof. The paper further gives a de-randomized algorithm, a parallel algorithm, and an extension to the lopsided Lovas local lemma. The new algorithmic paradigm involves resampling variables that cause bad events. Such resampling was subsequently used in numerous other papers, including ones that don't directly relate to the Lovas local lemma. Moreover, the paper provides an elegant proof of correctness involving witness trees. Witness trees have been influential well beyond the Lovas local lemma, inspiring the entropy compression method in combinatorics. Overall, the paper's power and simplicity make it a far-reaching achievement. Now, a little bit about the two authors. Robin Moser obtained his PhD in 2012 from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich, where he was a member of the research group of uh, Emo Belzil. His dissertation was an exact algorithms for constraint satisfaction problem, and this prize-winning work was part of his PhD dissertation work. His career included internships with the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Geneva, as well as with Microsoft Research in Redmond, Washington. Since 2013, he has worked developing training software and as a quantitative analyst in the Basel area in Switzerland. Gabor Tardosh re received his PhD in mathematics at Erdfosch University, uh, Budapest in 1988. His advisors were Laszlo Babai and Peter Pal Palfi. He held postdoctoral positions at the University of Chicago, Rutgers University, University of Toronto, and the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He was a Canada Research Chair of Discrete and Computational Geometry at Simon Fraser University from 2005 to 2013. 
After that, he returned to the Alfred Rennie Institute of Mathematics in Budapest, where he has been a research fellow. So my warmest congratulations to both, both of you who are here. Um, and now we will have a short 15 minute uh, presentation pre-recorded uh, with by Robin Moser, where he will um, give an exposition of the prize winning work. And after that, they'll both be available for further questions. So I will now, if I may stop my screen share. Hmm. There we are. Hello. First of all, let me express my thanks for this rather unexpected opportunity to present our work. And of course, I'd like to thank very much everyone involved in the decision of selecting the paper by Gabor and myself for this award. It's a big honor. So now let's talk about the local lemma. As you probably know, the Lovas local lemma is a powerful tool for proving the existence of certain combinatorial objects that meet a prescribed list of criteria. In one of its more generic and widely applicable formulations, what we have is a set of independent random variables and then a list of quote unquote bad events, each of which is determined by some subset of the variables. So each bad event forbids certain combinations of values for its variables. And what we are interested in is whether it's possible to avoid all the bad events at the same time. We now define the neighborhood of an event as the set of all other events with which that event shares common variables. So in particular, if two events are not in each other's neighborhoods, then they are determined by disjoint sets of variables and thus independent. Now the local lemma, as discovered in 1975 by Paul Erdős and Laszlo Lovas, basically says that if these neighborhoods are sufficiently small, then we can guarantee the existence of an assignment of values to the variables so that none of the bad events occur. Now, the way how the neighborhood sizes are quantified here in this inequality may seem somewhat intricate at first sight. But in essence, this is just a way of expressing that there is a trade-off between how likely an event is to occur and how large the neighborhood is allowed to be. Obviously, it's very intuitive that if you have a strong constraint, that is an event that is very likely to occur, then you can allow for fewer interdependencies with other events and vice versa. Now that has been known since 1975, but the question that was left open was whether there also exists an efficient algorithm for actually discovering an assignment of values that avoids all the bad events. The proof of the lemma as it was originally delivered by Erdős and Lovas is a deeply non-constructive counting argument and there is no way to derive from their proof a strategy of how to find a particular assignment of values to the variables that will meet those criteria. And in the present work, we figure out how to do that. When I first started working on this topic back in 2006, I was mainly interested in a particular application, which is the well-known satisfiability problem. And the reason I'm showing this here is not just to illustrate, you know, what kinds of interesting things one can derive from the lemma, but also in order to shed some light on the problem history. In satisfiability, the variables are usually Boolean, and then we have a formula made up of clauses or constraints, each of which forbids one particular assignment of values to k given variables. And please note here that when I use the terms clauses, constraints, or events, these are all interchangeable. It's all really the same thing here. And the question obviously is, is there an assignment of values to the variables such that all the constraints are satisfied? When applied to this particular problem, the local lemma tells you that if each constraint has shared variables with at most 2 to the k over e minus 1 other constraints, then the existence of such an assignment is guaranteed. Now that's a direct corollary of the lemma. You just have to set the mu values correctly and you get exactly that bound. And so then people started wondering about how to actually find such an assignment. The first big breakthrough was achieved in 1991 by Josef Beck, who presented a polynomial time algorithm, but only if we reduce quite dramatically the admissible neighborhood sizes, namely to roughly the 48th root of what the local lemma originally, originally allows. 
Shortly after Beck's breakthrough, Noga Alon provided a much simpler analysis that then allowed for 2 to the k over 8 neighbors. We then improved that to k over 6 in a first paper. Then there was work by Srinivasan lowering the bound to k over 4. Then another two papers, first to k half, then to k minus 5. And finally, together with Gabor, we managed to devise an algorithmic version that works essentially for every application of the local lemma. An interesting aspect I'd like to point out here is that there is a very nice continuity in these results, not only in the bounds as they improve over time, but also in the sense that the proof methodology has changed surprisingly little ever since the beck allon approach in 91. The concept that has been introduced already back then and that has survived all the way through to the work I'm presenting now is the concept of the so-called witness trees. Now here's a much oversimplified summary of the beck allon approach. Their basic idea was this. Let's start with a random initial assignment and then do local fixes as needed. Now what you see here is, if you will, a map of the constraint satisfaction problem. Every vertex represents a constraint and any two vertices are connected if they share common variables. If you now go ahead and apply a random assignment, you'll see that the majority of the constraints are already satisfied. And then there are a few constraints here and there that need to be fixed. Now Beck and Allon partitioned the constraints into three categories. The so-called safe constraints are very far from being violated in the sense that they are satisfied right now. And even if you were to flip a few variables in them, they'd still stay satisfied. Conversely, the bad constraints are either violated outright or very close to getting violated if a few variables are flipped. The dangerous constraints are kind of bridges in between these two. They look safe on their own right, but they share lots of variables with the bad constraints. So if we now go and apply local fixes, then those are the ones at risk of getting violated as well. Now the key idea here is that we fix the problematic areas by changing some variables locally. If these are small and disconnected from one another, as shown in this example, we can tackle them one by one by brute force. That is by just trying all possible assignments over variables in the bad constraints until they and all of their neighbors are satisfied. What the whole thing is contingent on is being able to show that with a high probability all problematic areas are small. To prove that, Beck and Allon basically used the spanning trees of these components and calculated the probability that there is a very large tree where all the constraints are simultaneously bad or dangerous. And then juxtaposed the set of all possible large trees, basically a first moment method, to show that with high probability only small problematic areas exist that we can then easily tackle one after the other by exhaustive enumeration. What's very interesting here is that all the key ingredients to the proof by Gabor and myself are already there. We only need to overcome the main limiting factor here and that is the brute force fixes. If you want to do local fixes by brute force, you can only allow for very small disconnected witness trees. And that creates lots of overhead and thus the need for huge amounts of slack in the admissible neighborhood sizes. Instead, what we will do now is randomly reassign the variables in violated constraints. This way we can allow for many more fixes and we can still use a very similar type of witness trees to document what fixes we have done, in what ordering, and then bound the probability that such witness trees can grow overly large. So here is the algorithm. We pick a random assignment of values to the variables, then we pick a constraint that is violated and pick a new random assignment for the variables in that constraint. And we do that over and over until the whole problem is satisfied. So this algorithm is really as easy as it gets. We just need to prove that it terminates. Of course, in principle, the fixing loop could carry on indefinitely, but we now use the witness tree idea to prove that it won't. Formally, what we show is this. Let n of a be the number of times a particular fixed constraint a has to be selected in this correction loop. Then the expected value of n of a is bounded by this term. 
Usually this is a constant. You remember this mu function from the hypothesis. In the case of ksat, for example, we can let mu equal to 2 to the minus ke. So the number of correction steps for each constraint is constant, or then for the whole problem, the number of correction steps will be linear. Now how do we prove that? So suppose, suppose we run this algorithm and here is the sequence of constraints that we had to fix. Now we go and ask for justifications for every single step we did. Why did we have to do the tieth correction? Why in the tieth step was it required to fix constraint AIT? Well, suppose AIT contains the variables x, y, z for the sake of example. And obviously right before step t, these variables were set in a way that violated that particular constraint. That's why we had to select it for fixing. So we ask, why at the time was each variable set the way it was? Suppose for the sake of example that x has never been resampled before. It still has its initial value that it was given during the selection of the random initial assignment. And let's further suppose that the variable y was reassigned in correction step number two and z reassigned in connection step, correction step number three. So the blue numbers here represent the step in which that particular variable received the value it held right before we picked AIT for correction. For the variables y and z that had already been resampled, let's track their history. Why were they resampled back then? Well, because in step three, we picked a constraint AI3 for correction, which contains that variable Z and some further variables. And in step two, we picked a constraint AI2, which contains variable Y and some further variables. Now we go on recursively and ask again, what values did all of these variables have before the respective resamplings? In this example, say that most of these variables got their values from the initial assignment. But variable w, let's say, had already been resampled before in step one due to a constraint containing w. So we attach that to our tree. The production of this what we call witness tree finishes as soon as we have tracked each variable's history back to its initial assignment. Now here is the key lemma. What is the probability that this particular tree that we see here appears somewhere as a witness tree during the execution of the algorithm? Well, what you need is that AI1 is violated at the beginning, then AI2 is violated, then AI3 is violated, and so forth. And the beauty here is, note how all the random samples that appear in this tree are independent from one another because even though the same variable appears multiple times, each time it appears, it has been resampled with a fresh random value. So the random samples are all independent from one another, and therefore we can just multiply all the probabilities to bound the likelihood that this very tree occurs at some point. To finish the proof, we consider all possible witness trees that could ever be seen. This way we can bound the expected number of times a constraint gets picked for correction, because every single such correction step, as we just saw, produces one of those witness trees to justify that step. And obviously during the execution of the algorithm, no two of these witness trees can be the same, because they must grow larger and larger during the execution. Now the only thing left to do is to actually do the calculation. So we have to figure out how large this exp expression can get. Now this is really just a calculation, which if this were a 30 minute talk, I could show in full detail, but since this time I got only 15 minutes, I can't. But it's really not difficult. It's more of a textbook exercise than anything else. The idea for it is that we impose a probability distribution on the set of all possible witness trees by growing them at random in what is called a Galton-Watson growth process. From that you get a probability distribution involving all of these terms and since they have to sum up to one you are left with this inequality here. And finally note that this probability is smaller than this product by the hypothesis of the local lemma. That's what we started with on the first slide and thus our bound on the running time is proved. Finally, a few concluding remarks and a select list of references. 
Firstly, there is a somewhat alternative perspective on the proof, where one replaces the concept of witness trees by an encoding of the execution journal as a bit string. And then from that bit string, the random bits used can, re can be reconstructed as well in a very similar manner as we did from the witness trees. And then one uses the incompressibility of random bits to argue that such an encoding cannot grow arbitrarily large. Here I'd like to mention that there was an independent paper by Pascal Schweitzer where he took this perspective of Kolmogorov complexity and found basically the same proof method, only just missing the realization that this can then be used as an efficient algorithm rather than just an alternative non-constructive proof method. Furthermore, there are many axes along which our algorithmic method can be further improved and many people have contributed interesting results. Let me list only a select few here. Firstly, there are some ways to relax the conditions under which the local lemma applies. For instance, the so-called lopsided dependency formalizes the concept that not all kinds of dependencies are equally harmful. Sometimes two constraints are dependent, but fixing one of them can never harm the other one. If that's the case, then one need not count that kind of dependency towards the neighborhoods, thus strengthening the result. Another direction are the criteria by James Shearer, which are better and tighter bounds for the event probabilities that still allow for an LLL application. And there has been work by Kolipaka and Segedi to also extend the algorithmic version up to the bound given by Shearer. There were several interesting studies on what the distribution is of the solutions output by our algorithm, which, when understood better, then admits for further applications that don't directly fall into the default framework. Notably, there was work by Heupler et al. in this direction and by Harris and Srinivasan. The algorithm can be parallelized. In our paper, we already do that, but with a number of limitations. That has been improved on as well, for example, in papers by Chung et al., Harris, and Heupler and Harris. And last but not least, the algorithm can also be de-randomized. Here as well, in our paper, we sketch a method, but we still require stronger assumptions for doing that. And there was subsequent work by Kandra Sekaran et al. and again by Harris to remove most of these weaknesses and make further applications of the local lemma deterministic. And as I said, the list goes on. There are many that I haven't listed here. A full survey would require much more time than I have, so my apologies to everyone whose contributions I failed to mention. Yeah, so that's it. Thanks very much for your attention, and we are happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right. Thank you very much for that. That was a very clear presentation of... Uh, of the result. Um, so can I ask if there are any uh, qu questions? I haven't seen any on the chat. You can either post on the chat, you can post on Slack, or you can raise your hand here on Zoom if you are here. I think there are some Congratulations on, on Slack. So, yes, and uh, Shedrov. So, so I saw some. Yes. Uh, the, well, certainly, in that case, let me just pass on warmest congratulations from, uh, uh, from everybody to both of you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, Thank I'll, you very I'll much. give a round of applause from everybody. Um, and I should have uh, said, as you know, the uh, the prize carries a cash award uh, as well as a certificate. Normally I would be handing, uh, handing these over to you at the ceremony if we were meeting in person, but uh, you, you will be receiving these. I mean, the, the treasurer of uh, uh, either EATCS or ACM will be in touch with you about, um, about the prize money. Okay. Great, thank well, you. All right. With that, Anka, I will hand over back to you. Thank you very much, Anush, and my warmest congratulations also to Gabo and Robin. And now I will let uh, Del Mila uh, the role of introducing the awards for, for Leaks, so for the Premier Award and the Test of Time Award. Please, Dale. Thank you. So presumably you can now see my slides. So uh, Lix every year has two awards 
two classes of awards given out. Um, the first, and I'll, I'll pre overview both of them here. The first is the Cleaney Award given to the best student paper. It's of course uh, named in honor of the late Stephen uh, Cleaney. Um, there is a criterion by which we select uh, the paper. And this year, the award is uh, given to Julian Grange, a student at uh, ENS in Paris. And we can read his, he'll receive this diploma in the mail along with a cash, a cash uh, prize. Uh, and I can recommend you uh, go watch the video and read the paper that you can find online. Okay. Uh, there's no presentation of this since he already has the paper online, the presentation online. Next is the Test of Time Award. Uh, this is given to papers that are 20, were published 20 years ago in Lix. And so in this case, uh, a committee uh, chaired by Terry Kokan examined all the papers from Lix 20, uh, 2000 for consideration of this year's award. And this year, uh, in general, they picked between zero and three award uh, awardees. And this year they picked two uh, these two papers are titled um, Concurrent Omega Regular Gram uh, Games by Luca de Alfaro and Thomas Hensinger. And the second paper, a Modality for Recursion by Hir Hiroshi Nakano. Uh, and for the next few, uh, several minutes, I pass it, uh, you uh, screen back to each of these two papers for their, them to give a short presentation. And after each presentation, we can uh, arrange for a couple minutes of questions if there's interest. So I will stop sharing and pass it back, hopefully to uh, Luca and Thomas, I believe. Yeah, Luca, please. Uh, okay. Luca will share. Yes, thank you. I will just say a few words and one slide at the beginning. Uh, so I want to, both of us, we want to thank, of course, for the honor, uh, the award to the, again, thanks go to the awards committee and to the community in general. Uh, also, new work, you know, is in isolation. So I also want to use this opportunity to thank our collaborators on concurrent games uh, who went partly before, namely Rajiv Alur and Oana Kupferman, and partly after. This particular work, this was uh, mostly Krishnendu Chatterjee and Rupak Majumda. I, Luca, if you can move to the next slide, please. Uh, I, I only, this is my only slide and I just wanna uh, uh, tell you what a concurrent game is because it's still 20 years now after, after this work, it's, it's still not that widely known, I, I should say certainly you know, graph games of a turn-based nature are much more common still in computer science, um, where you play on a graph and a token is moved along the edges of the graph and in each node of the graph, in a turn-based version of the game, one of the players uh, gets to move the token and usually the, the, the vertex determines which player gets, gets uh, to move the token. In a concurrent game, we have uh, both players choose independently of each other and unknown to each other simultaneously a move. And the choice of moves together determines the outcome, which is the next node in the game. So this is really, you know, a game theorist or an economist would immediately recognize this as a matrix game. Uh, so I call the two players here row and column. And suppose each player has two moves left and right or L and R. And if we are in state S and they happen to choose the same moves, they move to state T1 in this particular game. If they choose different moves, the uh, successor state here is T2. And uh, so you can really think of a concurrent graph game as a stateful matrix game. As with each, out, with each round of the matrix game, you know, the state of the game changes and starts over. Um, uh, so uh, mathematically, these games are incredibly rich. Uh, as you can already see here, determinism is no longer a zero one affair. You know, neither of the players can enforce a particular state in this simple game, nor prevent a particular state. Probabilities, randomized strategies immediately play a role. Values in general are now values between zero and one. Um, 
the uh, but there exist not necessarily you know optimal strategies to reach a value but only uh asymptotically and uh luca will give you you know uh, more, more details and and the, the way to algorithmically solve these games at least in five minutes in a very short version luca uh, thank you, Tom. I, I, I will uh, illustrate some of the winning conditions via snowball games, uh, as in the original paper. Um, so this is the same graph as before, except that when uh, uh, the two players uh, play uh, different moves, uh, they, they get to try again. And the illustration is uh, of a snowball game in which there is a blue player that can throw a snowball left or right and the red player that can try to dodge it by running left or right. And so if they uh, play different uh, directions, uh, the one snowball is wasted. And if they play the same direction, the snowball hits uh, and uh, the blue player reaches the target destination. And so in this game, uh, uh, deterministic strategies uh, don't allow player one, uh, player blue to win uh, because uh, uh, for every choice of moves, uh, player two can just play the opposite choice of moves uh, and always dodge uh, the snowballs. But of course, if the blue player plays uh, in a randomized fashion by choosing each move with equal probability, one half, then it, it player one, uh, the blue player gets to hit with probability one half at every round and probability one overall. So there are cases in which you need a randomized strategy and you can ensure winning with probability one, but things get even more interesting. There are cases in which you can only approach probability one, but never attain it. This is another snowball game in which there is uh, only one snowball available for player two. And so there is, uh, for the red player, there is uh, uh, the blue player hiding behind a hill and uh, the blue player wants to run back home, uh, exposing while running himself uh, to the snowballs of uh, the red player. The red player must decide at every round whether to wait or throw the snowball and uh, the blue player must decide whether to run or wait one more round. So, you know, this can be represented via a graph. Um, and if you reason about it, it's obvious that deterministic strategies, again, don't work. If you deterministically run, the adversary will throw. And if you wait forever, uh, then, uh, you know, you never reach home. Um, but if you run with a small probability P at every round, uh, it turns out that for the adversary, there is no point in waiting. Um, the best is to throw immediately. And so the adversary will hit you with the probability P, and so you will win with the probability one minus P. And because P is arbitrary, then you can make your winning probability as close to one as possible by running with a smaller and smaller probability. So you can approach probability one of winning. So there are these, uh, um, two ways of, uh, three ways of winning uh, such a game. There is uh, the way to win it with certainty, you know, in which all the uh, possible executions win, uh, probability one and limit probability one. And uh, um, these, I, I wanted to give a perspective on the solution forms of these games. I will actually not go into the solution formulas uh, for, for, the, uh, for the particular games that we presented in the Leaks paper, but I prefer to present a general overview. So in a, in a fundamental paper of 91, Emerson and Jutla provided a new calculus formulas that to solve deterministic uh, games. These are uh, either transition systems or turn-based games um, solved via the mu calculus, where uh, pre is uh, the controllable predecessor operator. Pre of x is all the states that can deterministically go to a set x of states. And so for safety, reachability, buhi, kobuhi, and uh, rabin chain on our, our alternating winning conditions, uh, there are beautiful mu calculus formulas that compute uh, the set of uh, winning states. So what we have done in this paper is uh, shown essentially that uh, mu calculus uh, via formulas that involve uh, not only um, with fixed point formulas that involve not only the state space, but also the individual moves appearing at each state, leads to a very beautiful solution of uh, the games that you can win with probability one and probability limit one. And there are particular thanks go to Krishnendu Chatterjee, uh, who joined us for the journal paper, and without whom I can honestly say that I don't think we, 
we would have um, you know, handed the stamina to find the, uh, to, to write the full proofs for the paper. Um, so another very beautiful result that we would like to recall here is a result with, with the Rupak Majumdar. Um, so if you take the original interpretation of Emerson and Jutla and you replace the predecessor operator with a quantitative predecessor operator, what is called in game theory as a, a best response operator sometimes, right? It's the, the operator that gives you the best value of the game given what happens at the successor states. So if you replace the pre with a quantitative predecessor, you replace intersection with, a, um, with minimum and union with maximum and you interpret the fixed point in a quantitative way, the same identical formulas of Emerson and Jutla actually give you the maximal probability of winning the game. And so, um, and so we titled the talk on the unreasonable effectiveness of uh, mu calculus for uh, concurrent games, um, because really we think that there is a, uh, this set of beautiful results that enable the computation of various winning conditions on games. And we were happy to be able to contribute to some of these results. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all my co-authors and uh, to the committee for selecting us for the award. Well, thank you very much, Tom and Luca. Uh, any quick questions? We have time for just a brief question. Is any, I don't see any on Slack or the chat. Okay, uh, in that case, since we're short on time, let's uh, stop the screen share, yes. And we switch now to Hiroshi Nakano to share your screen. Yes, we have you. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, um, anyway, thank you. I feel so honored to be given this award and congratulations to the other awardee, Lucan Thomas. Uh, I'm glad I'm, I, have been, I have been given the opportunity to give uh, this presentation on this nice occasion. Uh, today, I'd like to talk about the modality presented in my paper of uh, Rex 2000, uh, which I remember held at Santa Barbara, California. Uh, yes, it has been 20 years uh, uh, since then. I feel a kind of nostalgia. Anyway, now to start with, I'd like to clarify my viewpoint about uh, logical aspects of programming, uh, which have been my main interest ever since I was a student. I'm not sure how much this is shared within the people working in this area. But I think there are two kinds of logical activities involved when a programmer creates a program. Uh, one is the activity of construction that is uh, to construct a program from its parts. Uh, this is quite uh, considered parallel to the activity of uh, const uh, constructing proof in intuitionistic logic uh, through so-called the Curry Howard correspondence. Uh, the other one is deduction. I'm not sure this is adequate to naming. Uh, in general, this is the logical activity in the usual sense. For example, a to know uh, or to infer one plus one equals two, uh, work like that. Uh, basically, no program is involved in this activity. Uh, programmers think logically, but uh, I think it does not produce any programs. Uh, the logic is a classical one and can be uh, seen as, for example, the consequ uh, consequence rule of whole logic. The paper uh, at the Rex 2000 introduced a modality uh, which is represented by a, a bridge symbol in the paper. Uh, by the way, the, at that time, I called the modality the approximation modality and pronounce the type expression uh, written uh, by Brit A as almost A. Uh, yes, I know nowadays this kind of modality is what I call the later modality. Uh, anyway, the modality itself is very simple. 
Uh, this is just the same as a box modality of the standard model logic. Uh, that is, it means a kind of necessity in a sense. The key are the structure of the click frame we consider and the class of admissible types or specifications. The frame must be well-founded and uh, types must be monotonic uh, with respect to the uh, accessibility relations. Uh, types can become weaker according to the relation, but they cannot be weakened indefinitely since the frame is well-founded. Uh, this provides us a kind of induction schema, and this is a key of the idea. Uh, I also like to point out that no term construction involved in the semantics of the modality. Okay, uh, I said that at the first slide of this talk, uh, basically there are two kinds of logical aspects involved in uh, programming. Uh, we, if we class them into one logic, the emerging modal logic is very simple. Uh, it can be characterized these three axioms. Uh, the first one is the standard axiom uh, uh, K. Uh, it, and uh, in the context of the probability logic, the other two cor corresponds to the one called uh, completeness principle and the strong Lebesgue principle, respectively. Uh, but this view is too simplified. It hides the difference between the two logical aspects. So uh, the intended semantics of the modality must be formulated in another way. And the typing system with subtyping was present in the paper. Then two of uh, the three axioms became subtyping rules. Uh, and with uh, introducing these two rules, we also need other more generic uh, subtyping rules uh, like uh, uh, these two. The strong Lebesgue uh, principle only involves uh, term construction. Uh, but actually, the uh, rule becomes a theorem uh, rather than an axiom. Uh, this is because we can allow certain self referential type expressions uh, by virtue of the well foundedness of the frame. Um, the point of a uh, paper is like this, but I think the highlight is the modality can give the strong labels types to various kind of fixed point combinators. Uh, for me, uh, it is quite a surprise uh, that we can give uh, such axiomatic semantics to such mysterious lambda terms. Uh, furthermore, a couple of years ago, I also noticed that uh, it can also give it looping combinators uh, like this. Uh, on the other hand, I have many questions at that time. Uh, some have been solved, but some still remain. Uh, recently, I have gotten an interesting result about the second question. And so I'd like to show briefly uh, if consider the term model uh, and the frame uh, of natural numbers, then uh, uh, lambda term M has semantically the, uh, the type of strong Lambda principle if and only if M is a looping combinator. Uh, since the set of looping combinator is not uh, recursively enumerable, the theorem in the previous slide implies uh, that the semantics of the modality is, uh, is uh, the modality bullet is not axiomatizable. Uh, more precisely, uh, there is no formal typing system uh, that is sound and complete uh, with respect to a class of interpretation, including, including the one consisting of the term model and the frame. So I think this is uh, the answer to the second question of the uh, uh, the, the slide uh, I showed before. So uh, any uh, no further directions? Uh, I think that some questions about the modality still remain. So I'm very happy you someone let me know the, uh, know the answers. So one extra slide I have. Uh, so 
sometimes uh, I, I, I'm asked uh, how, uh, what inspired uh, the modality. So, so, so let me answer th th that kind of questions. So originally, uh, M colon uh, brick A means that uh, A realize A or uh, M realize A after one step reduction. Uh, it was um, uh, in uh, the uh, talk uh, presented in the uh, 1998 uh, uh, at Slacks. Uh, so um, this, uh, you know, this was uh, the kind of uh, uh, step index uh, realizability. So that this is very, I think, close to the uh, one of later modality. So the semantics of the uh, Lix 2000 paper is um, uh, a kind of purified uh, form of this. So, uh, so, so the truth is, uh, I, I was, I. Uh, <laughs> I had not noticed the, uh, the line of work in the context of probability logic. So actually, uh, I did not inspired by the uh, Leibniz uh, principle uh, in this work. OK, uh, thank you. This is the end of this talk. Thank you very much for your presentation. Any quick questions? So again, I don't see any on the relevant uh, sites. Okay, so in that case, uh, let me just say it's, it was very nice to hear these talks presented, very clear presentations, and to be reminded just how important uh, results from 20 years ago can still be and how interesting they can still be today. Uh, so in that case, uh, I'll pass the, um, the video back to Anka. Thank you very much, Dale. So I'll go over to the third part of this award session. So to the IATCS Pressburger Award. So uh, as you might know, so this award is uh, thanks. So it's named after Pressburger, who uh, introduced uh, his big result on Pressburger arithmetics as a student in. Uh, 1929. So the award is uh, oh, is uh, to the address of, of young researchers who uh, contribute in a major way to uh, to uh, theory of computation and uh, theoretical com computer science in general. So I have the big pleasure to announce the awardee of this year's um, Pressburger Award. It is Dmitry Zhuk from the Lomonosov, Moscow Lomonosov State University. So together with my colleagues, Tore Husfeld and Nina Mahajan, we received a lot of uh, very impressive nominations for the Pressburg Award, but the one of Dmitry uh, was, was particularly impressive for, for us. So um, Dmitry contributed to resolving one of the most well-known uh, conject conjectures or problems, open problems in the theory of computation, which is the CSP uh, dichotomy conjecture of Feder and Vardy. So Feder and Vardy formulated the conjecture uh, at stock in the late 90s. So this was a, con uh, a problem open for roughly 25 years. And Dimitri uh, brought the, the final answer. So after a uh, succession of, of papers on, on the topic of uh, due to a big community uh, who works on, on CSPs. And he uh, brought this solution together with uh, independently, actually inventor of Andrei Bulatov. So they, uh, they showed that the dichotomy conjecture is true and uh, they, they brought uh, impressive uh, uh, solutions based on an algebraic approach. So I will now uh, show you maybe the um, I thought I have here the certificate, but I see that the certificate is not here. So I will then stop the sh screen sharing and uh, let Dimitri talk about his results.
quickly. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor for me to receive this award. Thank you very much. Thank you for choosing me. And uh, let me tell about this result. Probably you're surprised to see this uh, title, but uh, I really think that my main result is a classification of key relations preserved by a weak unanimity operation. And this is really amazing result because uh, it describes, uh, it uh, says that every relation we need to consider has a beautiful structure inside. But unfortunately, nobody cares about this one. And probably this result is too algebraic to uh, talk about. So I will move to the proof of CSP dichotomy conjecture. OK, um, I will start with the definition. What is CSP or constraint satisfaction problem? Formally, it's a triple. So we have set of variables. We have set of respective domains. And we have set of constraints. And we also assume that all the constraint relations are from gamma, which we call a constraint language. Uh, probably all of you know why CSP is a very important problem, but in case you don't believe me, you should believe Andrei Bulatov, who said in his talk that almost any problem we solve in real life is a constraint satisfaction problem. So this is a very important problem. First, I want to show you three examples of a constraint satisfaction problem. And the first example is graph to coloring. So assume that we have a graph and we want to color its vertices uh, so that adjacent vertices have different colors. So here in this case, we have uh, two elements in our domain. It's uh, red and blue colors. And we have just one predicate in our constraint language. It's inequality. How to solve this problem? Let's just start coloring. So assume that the first variable is red then these two should be blue, and these three should be red, and so we get a contradiction. What it means that we get a contradiction? This means that uh, we found an odd cycle, and this means that this instance has no solutions at all. So actually, this problem is easy because every time we can either color all the vert vertices, or we can find an odd cycle, and this is actually a proof that there is no solution. And so this problem can be solved locally. We just start from one vertex, and uh, color all the remaining vertices. Okay, so uh, just uh, let's remember that uh, this problem can be solved by a local consistency check. And this is my first example. My second example is a system of linear equations in a field. So here we assume that in our domain, we have three elements, zero, one, and two. And in our constant language, we have uh, linear equations modular three. Then any instance of CSP is just a system of linear equations. And we know how to solve this problem efficiently. We know that using Gaussian elimination, we can solve this problem in polynomial time. And this is my second example. So for this uh, domain and this constant language, the problem can be solved in polynomial time. And the third and the last example, it's a uh, graph th three coloring. Everything is the same, but this time we have three colors. And again, we have just one predicate in our constant language. Uh, again, let's try to solve this problem by a local consistency check. So put some color here, then this three vertices should be either blue or green, and we cannot say anything about the remaining vertices. So we cannot get a contradiction using local consistency check. But also we can check that this uh, concrete instance doesn't have a solution. For example, if we, if we start with these two colors, red and blue, then this should be red, this should be... Uh, no, this should be green, this should be blue, and these two should be red. And again, we get a contradiction. So this instance doesn't have a solution, but we could not uh, get a contradiction by local consistency check. And actually we can prove that this problem isn't hard. So we strongly believe that uh, this problem cannot be solved in polynomial time. And this is my third example. Okay, and now I want to, uh, define a decision problem I consider. Uh, today I consider only constraint satisfaction problem over a finite domain. So let A be a finite set and let gamma be a set of relations on the set A. And this gamma, as I said before, we call a constraint language. Then for every constraint language gamma, we define a decision problem, CSP over gamma. This is like this, given a conjunction of relations uh, where all the relations are from gamma and we need to decide whether the formula is satisfiable. For example, if we are on three element domain and we have just two predicates, x less than y and uh, x less than or equal to y, then this instance doesn't have a solution because we are on three element domain. And for example, this instance has a solution, for example, 0, 0, 0. 
Anyways, the main question I consider today is uh, uh, what is the complexity of CSP over gamma for different constant languages gamma? As we saw from my examples, for some constant languages, this problem is easy and can be solved in polynomial time. And for some constant languages, this problem isn't too hard. So we believe it's uh, difficult and can be solved in polynomial time. So the main question is to distinguish between uh, easy cases and difficult cases, and also to prove that we don't have anything else. So for every gamma, the problem is either tractable or NP hard. Okay, let's go back to my examples. Uh, we have three examples, and uh, in the first one, everything could be solved by local consistency check. Um, in the second example, it was just Gaussian elimination because we had just system of linear equations. And in the third example, the problem was difficult and NP hard. And what we know, we know that on two element domain, uh, these are the only cases we can have. So in 1978, Schaeffer proved that for every gamma on two element domain, either the problem can be solved by a local consistency check, or the problem can be solved by Gaussian elimination, or the problem isn't hard. Okay, uh, how to distinguish between these three cases? To distinguish between them, we need to use polymorphisms. Uh, I'm not sure whether you know what it is, so I give you a definition. Uh, we say that an operation F deserves uh, a relation R, or equivalently, we say that F is a polymorphism of R. If for any tuples from R, we look at the tuples as at uh, columns. If we apply our operation coordinate wise, we get a tuple which is also from the relation. And then using this definition, we can easily, easily distinguish between these three cases, C, L, and H. So for every gamma on two element domain, uh, if T junction, conjunction, or majority operation preserves gamma, then the problem can be solved by local consistency check. If X plus Y plus Z preserves gamma, then our instance is, is just system of linear equations. So it can be solved by Gaussian elimination. And if gamma has only essentially unary polymorphism, the problem is NP hard, so it's difficult. Okay, uh, what about the larger domains? The problem on larger domains is that this uh, L, C, and H can be mixed like this or even like this. But it's easy to notice that if we have H somewhere in A, then the problem is NP hard. What I mean by H being in A? By this, I mean that there exists B, which is a subset of A, and an equivalence relation sigma on B, such that uh, all polymorphisms in B over sigma are essentially unary. Probably it's not completely clear from this definition, but the idea is that somewhere inside A, inside our domain, we can find a small part uh, where the problem is as difficult as uh, a problem for, uh, for the full gamma, if gamma contains all the relations. Okay, uh, after this observation, we can formulate CSP dichotomy conjecture. What is the border between tractable cases and NP hard cases? Uh, so we can uh, conjecture that CSP over gamma is in P if there is no H in A. And CSP over gamma is in P complete otherwise. Uh, later in 2006, uh, because of the result of Ralph McKenzie and Miklos Marotti, this conjecture uh, was formulated in the following easy and nice way. CSP over gamma is in P if gamma has a weak new polymorphism and CSP over gamma is in P complete otherwise. Here in the bottom, you can see the definition. And uh, you can check that uh, majority uh, disjunction, conjunction, X plus Y plus Z, all of the separations are weak unanimity operation. So this is just a generalization of what we had for two element domain. So now we have an easy conjecture and easy criterion on when the problem is difficult and when the problem can be solved in polynomial time. Uh, notice that in one direction, this conjecture was uh, Follows from the result of Ralph McKenzie and Mikos Marotti. So we knew for from 2006 that if we don't have weak unanimity polymorphism, then uh, the problem isn't too hard. So the only remaining and open question was to find a polynomial algorithm for all gamma that are preserved by weak unanimity polymorphism. Okay. Now I want you, uh, I want to tell you a short history of this conjecture. And I want to apologize because I'm going to miss uh, a lot of nice results. Uh, probably I just don't have time to mention all of them. And uh, the first result uh, I already mentioned for two element domain, uh, we know that we have only three cases. Either the problem can be solved by local consistency, uh, which is denoted by C, or the problem is just a system of linear equations. 
and can be solved by Gaussian elimination. And that's uh, what I denote by L. And uh, uh, sometimes the problem is in P-half. And the classification, so the CSP dichotomy conjecture was proved by Schaeffer in 1978. For the element domain, uh, it can be uh, more complicated, so L and C can be mixed. But Andre Buato found a way how to split L and C. And so he proved C speed dichotomy conjecture for this case. Uh, then for four element domain, the situation can be even more complicated. But in 2012, uh, Peter Markovich announced that he has a proof for this case. So he found a way how to split L and C, linear case and consistency case. But uh, as far as I know, his proof uh, was too long, and so he never published it. OK, then for five element domain, uh, in 2016, I found a way how to decompose this C and L. And then I improved my method a bit, and it started to work up to domain of size 7. Then I improved it a bit more, and it started to work up to domain of size 9, and actually, uh, at that time, I was pretty sure that it worked in general, but I couldn't prove this. And then, uh, unfortunately, Andre Buat repeated with his proof. And, uh, and only after that, I finally proved that my method works in general for any domain of any size. Okay, and probably I just have two minutes. Uh, I want to tell you a few words about my algorithm. How do I decompose the C and L thing? So imagine we have this pile of C and L. I look at the top of this pile. What I can uh, have on the top? If I have L on the top, and what I mean by this? By this, I mean that I have an equivalence relation on A, such that uh, model this equivalence relation or polymorphism of A over sigma are linear or affine operation. Or in other words, this means that model this sigma, I can look at my CSP instance, and I can write this instance model this sigma. So model this sigma, I always get uh, a system of linear equations. Okay, so what I actually do uh, if I have L on the top? I can use Gaussian elimination to solve systems of linear equations model this sigma. That's what I can do. What I also can do, I can use recursion to check whether uh, a concrete solution of a system of a linear system uh, gives a general solution. Because uh, if I have a concrete solution of a system of linear equation, then I need to consider uh, just one piece, uh, which you can see on the picture. And every piece is a CSP instance on a smaller domain. So it's an easier problem. That's why I can do this. So if I have L on the top, I just uh, combine these two ideas. OK, what if I have C on the top? In this case, everything is even easier. What it means to have C on the top? It means that uh, there exists some B, which is strictly smaller than A, such that any consistent instance has a solution if and only it has, in, uh, it has a solution with X inside, uh, being inside of B. So it means that I can uh, safely reduce our domain to this B, and I know for sure that I cannot use all the solutions. And this is an easy way to uh, simplify my instance. And for example, how to choose this B, uh, if you have a binary polymorphism satisfying uh, two conditions, uh, f of BA is from B and f of AB is from B, then I can choose this B safely. And I can prove that if I have C on the top, then I can always find this B. And so what I do if I have C on the top, I, redu I reduce my domain to B, so I get an easy CSP instance, and I just solve this easy CSP instance. So this is briefly an idea. I hope at least uh, the idea is clear. Probably I don't have time for anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dimitri, for this very clear talk. So we have some time for questions, some quick questions. I'm looking on the chat. There's no question on the chat and no question on Slack, I think, either. So I have a question, naive question, so about the complexity of your algorithm. How does it depend on the size of the domain? Um, the truth is that I never counted because uh, it's uh, really uh, recursive. And I use recursion in many places. That's why it's really difficult to 
calculate the complexity, uh, yeah, the complexity and calculate this polynomial. But okay, uh, so yeah, I'm pretty sure that this polynomial is uh, pretty bad. So I would not use my algorithm in practice. Okay. Are there perhaps other questions? You can also unmute your micro if you are on Zoom. I'm just waiting a little bit because on YouTube, people get this uh, video with a delay of 20 seconds. So. so maybe if I may. Yes. Uh, I, I want to answer your question, Anka. I, I believe you, your question was different, how it depends on the size of the domain. So the answer is exponentially. So it would be nice to have an algorithm so that it depends polynomial on the size of the domain. That's an uh, open problem. OK. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Leba. OK, so I think that no further questions, but maybe that there might be so you can have a look at Slack uh, after because it stays open. So, so I congratulate uh, again, Dimitri, also on behalf of Mina and Tore, who are on YouTube, on the YouTube stream. And yeah, so with this, I think this, this nice, very nice award session is, uh, is the end of the session. So I would like to congratulate everybody for, for all the, the, the awards and see you at the next session then in, yeah, a bit less than half an hour. We leave this session open for those that want to socialize and talk a bit randomly uh, until the next session starts. Thanks a lot to everyone. And congratulations. Congratulations. Yes, congratulations, everyone. Congratulations. Congratulations.